Hey everybody, it's Kyla. Welcome back to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Today I have been on the podcast and we're going to be talking about everything from what is NATO, getting into the details of what NATO is for and how this relates to the current situation in Russia and Ukraine. We're also going to talk about energy markets. We're going to talk about the Fed and really just the international geopolitical angle of all the different things that are going on in the market. One thing that we did not hit on uh, was Turkey. I will be back tomorrow with a video explaining what's going on in Turkey and how they are just doing some funky stuff with fiscal and monetary policy. So that will be tomorrow. Some things that are happening right now is the market's trying to figure out what's going on with Omicron. It seems very, very transmissible. So markets are trying to figure out what's going on with that. There was a little bit of a battle on Twitter the past couple hours. Uh, Jack versus Web3 VCs. I have a little comic that I'm going to throw up. I think explains most of it in my opinion. I think this big debate between VCs and Jack and just in general gets back to my piece that I had yesterday about this narrative cycle. So we have narrative creation and then we have narrative resistance and then we have narrative disruption. Jack doesn't have to cosign on any sort of narrative. I actually think that a lot of people are missing the boat on this one. Part of crypto is it's meant to so you can do what you want, right? And I, I guess he's kind of speaking in extreme terms that Bitcoin is the one solution, but if he thinks that, like, let him think that. You know, he's a narrative disruptor. He's a very important figure in tech. It gets messy out there. It's dramatic. I hope that you enjoy the video. Hi, Ben. How's it going? Hey, Kyla. So Good. Thank film. you for having me back for week four now the kyla the kyla and ben show or the ben show <laughs> with kyla like, yeah thanks so much for coming back on there's always so much happening in the world so excited to chat with you about everything that's going on including an update on the situation over in russia and ukraine as well as some things happening locally here in the united states of course all right do you want to just jump right into nato yeah we can talk about nato so yeah. nato as you know is the north atlantic treaty organization and so it consists of europe and then Canada and the United States. But it also has like partners who are like not part of these members. And so the partners are kind of broken up in the three categories. The countries that are in that aren't in the Atlantic, but they're part of the US alliance system. And so that's Australia, Japan, South Korea, and Colombia. I guess Colombia technically could be in the Atlantic, right? Uh, but it is not in the northern Atlantic. So there's that. But these are countries that are in the US's like sphere of influence. They are part of the West. Uh, you know, whether or not South Korea is fully part of the West is up for debate. But generally, if it's part of the U.S. alliance system, you can consider it part of the West. Now, New Zealand's also a partner, but New Zealand and the United States don't have a formal alliance and haven't for 40 years. But because of their proximity to Australia, right, it's just kind of expected if anyone, God forbid, attacked Australia, that New Zealand would be protected. Just to pause, so, so NATO, as we talked about in the last episode, is an alliance that formed in order to protect against the potential spread of the Soviet Union, right? And so the United right. States is in there. It's a lot of European countries, Canada, etc. NATO is gearing up, sort of, because of what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. And NATO primarily exists for war, right? So like, how did NATO get its status and what does that mean for its growth. NATO is definitely a defense pack. If they're gearing up, I don't want to say they're gearing up because most of the military equipment they already have has already been made, right? Uh, everyone just has a standing army at this point. So they're definitely preparing, though, uh, and trying to sort through the mess that would be a Ukrainian invasion, especially since even though Ukraine is not a NATO member, like the members of the Baltics are, Lithuania, Poland promised to defend uh, Ukraine. So it gets kind of messy there, right? Because if they are defending Russia or defending Ukraine against Russia, that does not trigger Article 5. Article 5 is the thing that says, I've been attacked, and then everyone comes and defends them, right? Uh, but them going in there in the first place, it could trigger Article 5 risks, right? Because say Russia then goes and bombs, you know, Warsaw or something. Is that an attack that, you know, triggers Article 5? Or is it, you know, Poland started the war, so now they have to back it up? Now, in terms of the other part of your question, how do they get the status to prevent an invasion of this is simply the Red Army was the premier land army after the Second World War, and they needed a way to kind of rope in British and French and Western Germany uh, military defenses along with Italy 
to kind of defense it, defend against that Soviet invasion. There's also countries that the U.S. has been at war with for the past several years, right, who are partners to NATO. Yeah, like so Iraq and Afghanistan both have membership, but this isn't because uh, like we determined that they would be a great partner, but rather because it allows NATO to assist in security operations inside the countries. Um, for instance, before the Taliban had taken over Afghanistan, the NATO was training these troops in Afghanistan, and they were also training, they still are training Iraqi troops. So they are members of NATO, right? But if, say, you know, Poland gets invaded tomorrow, Iraq and Afghanistan aren't running to defend Poland the way Australia, Japan, um, and South Korea might be. So that's kind of the difference. Pakistan also has that status, but that's kind of because uh, the United States needed access into Afghanistan, right? Uh, it's it's a landlocked country. And so without Pakistan, you have to go through Iran, who obviously mm. wasn't going to work. And then without Pakistan or Iran, then you have to go through Russia, who initially was compliant, towards the end was not very compliant. So really, that's your only way through. So they need Pakistan. So that's kind of why Pakistan got that status. But it will be removed very soon. So what's going on with Pakistan, though? So like, why why is Pakistan about to get booted out of, of NATO potentially? The United States have a very turbulent relationship. Before 9-11, Pakistan was under extreme sanctions because they developed nuclear weapons without the express consent of the United States. And they're probably like, well, the United States aren't the nuclear police, so who cares, right? But this was a pretty big backstab because Pakistan had pledged to the United States that they would not develop nuclear weapons. In fact, they had this very, I'm missing her name, but a very famous ambassador envoy to the United States who lied to Congress on several times saying we're not building nuclear weapons. And eventually Clinton's administration had no choice but to say, we know we know you have them, so we have to sanction you, right? 9-11 happens and the United States is, the United States kind of given, uh, you know, like when something bad happens in your life and everyone's like suddenly nice to you? And you like you can get away with literally everything. So after 9-11, that kind of happens on the global stage. So the mm -hmm. United States goes to Pakistan. And they're like, all right, like, let's be pals. Right. And they're like, yeah, remove the sanctions. So they remove the sanctions. And they also needed to like a pathway in to, you know, Afghanistan. Right. And so by being a NATO partner, they're given cash, they're given money. The earthquake happens in 2006. Pakistan's given uh, funds to recover from both the United States and NATO and as well as the European allies separate from NATO. So that's, you know, that is why Pakistan has this NATO thing is to help them. Now, why they're going to get booted is because Pakistan started uh, the Taliban back during the Afghan civil war, during the Soviet invasion. They they funded the Taliban, right? Um, there are a lot of people who suggest that the U.S. money, you know, the U.S. helped a, a Pakistan in funding the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, but that's not true. There are two separate groups of fighters, but that's for a different episode. So, but at the core of it is that Pakistan started the Taliban. And when the United States eventually makes friends with them, they say, you can't fund the Taliban anymore. You're done with that. And so Pakistan stops. The United States gets rid of the Taliban within a year, not even less than that. And so Afghanistan becomes a very stable democracy. But then the United States invades Iraq, right? And the United States is trying to like offload Afghanistan. So they allow India to move in. And so India is like moving, taking moves because India has strategic reason, right? And that is to push and press on Pakistan because now they are not only below Pakistan, but now they're on top of Pakistan. And so Pakistan did not like this and started refunding the Taliban again. And in 2006 onward, they just keep funding them more and more and more. And so when the United States kind of leaves Afghanistan, after 2006, Taliban takes up all the land that they, the United States had formerly seized. Then there's a troop surge. And during the troop surge is what is called uh, the, I believe in Pakistan, they call it the unspeakable years or the unforgotten years or the forgettable years, something like that. But basically, the United States deploys nearly 100,000 troops, and that's not counting NATO. And they press on Al Qaeda and the Taliban very, very hard in Afghanistan. And so much so that these terrorists who had been funded by Pakistan had now pushed down into Pakistan. And so it is now causing Pakistan to have record suicide bombings, record terrorist attacks and stuff like that. Um, and this is a, an item of their own creation here, right? Like these are their fighters who are now, you know, as Hillary Clinton said, you can't have snakes in your backyard and expect them only to bite your neighbor. So it's a lot of tension there. And so this all kind of, this continues and the United States eventually pulls out of Afghanistan. But the Taliban has now taken over Afghanistan is funded and paid for by Pakistan. And so there's a lot of arguments back and forth about I could present both sides, but we don't have time for that. But essentially, the United States is peeved at what Pakistan has done here with the Taliban funding over the past 14 years. And they are going to be kicked out of NATO because they're no longer needed. But also when they were needed, they didn't prove to be that great of a friend. Are there any other subcomponents of NATO? Or yeah. yeah, Mongolia. And that is because Mongolia has this diplomacy policy called the third neighbor policy, which is 
Mongolia actually only has two neighbors, Russia and China, right? They have the third neighbor policy, which applies to everyone else, right? And so that also implies to the United States, Japan, South Korea, India. And so the United States kind of views Mongolia as a strategic launching point for control of the Indo-Pacific. So they view them as a way to connect India and Japan together in a way that matters, right? Now you're thinking about it, well, at the end of the day, you have to go through Russia and China eventually, right? If we're going to do like a land trade. But that is their diplomatic goal is to kind of create them into a block, right? And it, it it's more so like I, I, at a surface level answer here would be it's to annoy Russia and China, which is at its core, basically the answer. But also it's kind of just this is a strategic element. I guess in the case that war ever broke out, Having Mongolia on your side, no matter how weak they actually are, would be very helpful. Beneath the partners, there's another layer of like strategic like treaties and stuff like that. And that's like Bahrain, Israel, uh, as well as I think Malaysia somehow in one of them. Uh, and it's kind of just like, you know, they're part, but that's more so part of their diplomatic and political wing of promoting. They're kind of like on a diplomatic level and have nothing to do with defense at all. NATO, like we kind of talked about at the beginning, right? It's this big thing that was created to prevent the spread of the Soviet Union, but now it does a lot more than that, right? So it's not just like trying to battle Russia all the time. What are some primary things that NATO does and what do they do in order to protect those things that they focus on? The Soviet Union is obviously gone, you know, they're <laughs> deceased, dead. So a lot of people say NATO is a organization without a purpose, but that's not really the truth, right? So the truth here is that NATO has now just pivoted to kind of being an influence block, right? So it has a couple, right? Its core purpose is still the defense of Europe and North America from Russia, right? But Russia is not the Soviet Union. NATO has also intervened since the Soviet Union fell apart. So like they don't attack, they're a defense pact, but they mm -hmm. they have intervened in the past. Some examples of this is during the Balkans War, uh, you know, after Yugoslavia broke up, there was this massive civil war. And so NATO intervened with bombing, uh, humanitarian intervention, stuff like that. It's a big point of controversy. And then when Iraq invaded Kuwait, that was a big uh, point in which they intervened. There was like a 40 country some coalition to kind of, you know, drive Saddam's forces out of Kuwait. Then there's also remember in like 2008 when like pirates were taking everything, right? The global economy had crashed and then also we got Blackbeard back. So off the coast of Somalia, they did anti-piracy operations. And then, of course, the most controversial one is Libya. Everyone has the timeline messed up on this. Europe started that fight, and it was not a NATO fight until Europe was massively outclassed and just did not have the materials they needed to complete the mission. And that is when the United States got involved. So there's that. But also another unspoken benefit, Kyla, is that it prevents wars, right? So seven of the world's top 20 militaries are in NATO. And so if a NATO member attacks another member, then the rest of NATO fights the attacker. Right. So it keeps the peace. Right. So if you're Germany and you're like, it looks like it's been 100 years, let's start it back up. You can attack France or Belgium because then you have to deal with everyone else. Right. And it's also kind of tested the limits before because Greece and Turkey, this is kind of an unknown conflict among the general public, but they hate each other and have at mm -hmm. times nearly just like duked it out. And so, you know, famously during a crisis in the 90s, Bill Clinton kind of laid down the gauntlet to both Greece and Turkey and said, whoever attacks first is getting the smoke. And so keeps the peace in Europe, which is a country that has a lot of other things keeping it binding to peace. But let's not mistake ourselves. They tore themselves apart for 1,000 or 1,500 years. There's no reason they have to get along now. So it's one thing that helps us. And it also helps the U.S. pivot to Asia, right? So if the United States is not in a security relationship with Europe, it would have to defend against Europe, Right. So prior to World War II, the United States was kind of on its own, right? And it was, the United States was just expanding westward and harassing everyone south of them. Now, the United States still harasses people to the south of them, but they also control Europe, right? So if they did not have to worry about Europe, or if they, if they weren't in a security relationship with Europe, then you would have this massive, you know, they'd have to be gearing up to defend against, you know, the UK, against France. So it helps the United States spend less on that, right? The Atlantic's like your safe ocean none of your adversaries are in there so you don't really have to worry about it and also the economy goes burr as i think you finance people say right because europe can't destroy itself so there's that okay so essentially it's kind of like nato is sort of the big kid on the playground five giant kids that all hang out with each other and they don't fight each other because they know that they have to protect against other giant kids from other schools <laughs> is that kind of the deal yeah, it's basically like that but it's also like 
it had it initially formed to defend against the Soviets, but now it should just be considered the kind of the core of the Western alliance, mm-hmm. the thing that binds the United States to Europe, but also um, Australia and Japan don't have mm-hmm. a relationship. Europe, right? I guess Australia and UK, but it's not that strong. And so it also binds them because they're US allies, not European allies to Europe as well as partners. So it is the Western bloc. It is the Western alliance. So that's a good way of thinking about it. And it's kind of NATO is that military wing. Even though the United States still spends a lot of money on defense spending, it's not as high as it could be because essentially Europe's like, all right, we're not going to go to war with each other like we used to. And so that enables things to be more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. If the United States had to defend against Europe, defense spending would be insane. I have another question for you um, about okay. Russia and Ukraine. Just like an update there. What's the situation looking like? And nothing's really changed. Russia says they're going to deploy mid-range nuclear weapons, whatever. Um, like threatening nuclear weapons is so dumb because it doesn't like do it, you know, like no one wants to do it. So uh, other than that, nothing's really changed. Ukraine says they're going to do it. Some other countries have said they'll pledge to defend Ukraine. Uh, the United States has reiterated its support for cutting off SWIFT, right? And that's kind of the nuclear bomb sanctions. I have seen some people suggest that Russia would use a nuclear weapon in response to that. I think everyone, <laughs> everyone's stuck in this Cold War mindset where it's like war between yeah. Russia and the United States has to be nuclear war. The only risk of nuclear weapons here is it being used on the battlefield to escalate to de-escalate. So I think everyone should calm down. How do, is it FOMC or is it? It is, yeah. So it's not like NATO. It's not like NATO. So FOMC. So yeah, <laughs> talking about uh, the economy. All countries have their own central banks that essentially dictate monetary policy. So in every single country, there's fiscal policy. So that's led by the US government. And that's going to be like paying tax. Taxes, it's going to be fiscal spending, um, and then there's monetary policy, and that's going to be things that involve intervention with banks and other things like that, um, really trying to support the economy. So the United States has the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve makes these monetary policy decisions around the state of the economy. So when the pandemic happened back in March of 2020, the Federal Reserve had to swoop in. It's like that dog that sits in the room that was on fire, right? Like everything was an absolute mess during March of 2020 and onward. So the Fed had to come in to provide a floor to both the economy and the stock market because here in the United States, Main Street and Wall Street are essentially one circle in the Venn diagram. The Fed swooped in. But what they did during that time was made things very easy. They lowered rates to basically zero. So that would encourage banks to go and give consumers loans to make sure that the economy was still functioning at that baseline level. But they also did direct intervention into the stock market by buying up corporate bonds, which was pretty unprecedented, really like directly intervening into the stock market in that way. And the Fed kept up this very, very easy monetary policy uh, basically until very recently. So the whole thing was like, okay, so the economy is kind of recovering, right? So the Fed has to worry about inflation and jobs. And uh, the most recent CPI print, which is how um, inflation is gauged, the Fed used is a different print, but the CPI print was 6.8%, which means that inflation is, is quite high, like things are very expensive. And so the Fed has a responsibility to respond to those inflationary metrics, but they also have a responsibility to to the jobs market, so how the employment rate, how people are getting hired, the diversity, the composition of the job market. And so they have to weigh the job market and price stability and all of these different monetary policy decisions that they make. And so they came out yesterday and they were like, we see that things are getting real hot. Um, we understand, like, yeah, it's kind of crazy out there. And they were like, we will speed up our tapering process, which means that they're going to stop buying so many bonds, stop providing a floor to treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Um, And they also noted that we're getting closer to their goal of maximum employment, which means that they are probably going to raise interest rates in March of 2022. They have three rate hikes priced in for next year, but we don't know when those rate hikes will begin. It probably will begin in March because that's when the taper is going to roll off. And when when they raise rates, that is a sign to the economy, hey, slow down, stop spending so much money, consumers chill out, businesses chill out, everybody chill out because inflation is so hot, the jobs market is so hot. Um, but the whole conversation was hawkish with, like, it was a dove in hawk's clothes, meaning that, like, everything was meant to come across as, like, oh, we think things are crazy right now, like, whoa. But really, if you, like, kind of look at how everything played out, there's still a lot of uncertainty. I don't think the Fed is super confident 
confident. Um, and they know way more than I do, but I don't think the Fed is super confident in the decision that they made. Yeah, even Jerome Powell, he came out and said, no one knows with any certainty where the economy will be a year or so. Right. So, that was a lot. So how? So what is the risk of inflation here? So like, how serious is this risk, right? So he actually remarked on that. And he was like, yeah, <clears throat> there's like a high chance that inflation ends up becoming entrenched. And that's what we're trying to prevent. And so the Fed sees inflation remaining around 5% this year, but they see inflation going down to 2.6% next year. And this is primarily going to be because of these rate hikes that's supposed to rein the economy in, prevent all these inflationary metrics from coming. But if you actually think about like the function of inflation, the function of inflation is made up of the supply chain woes. Uh, you can't really like raise rates and fix supply chains. That's just not something that monetary policy can directly intervene with. It's also the labor wage issue. So you can't raise rates and make people go back to work. Like they're going to be like, whatever, dude, I don't care. And then it's also consumer spending, consumer demand. So like if you think about that supply demand function, if you have more people demanding the same amount of goods, even less goods because of the supply chain worries, that means that prices are going to have to go up. So you have those three things that are really the functionality of inflation and raising rates only really addresses one of them. So I right. to answer your question in like the longest way possible, um, <laughs> that's kind of the deal with inflation. They think that they can raise rates three times, get it down to 2.6% and all that stuff will be solved. I guess, so here's my question here. So, you know, among the casual, I guess people like me, when you mm -hmm. hear the economy's hot, this seems like mm -hmm. a good thing. But mm -hmm. Powell's over here, he wants Mr. Freeze, he wants to cool it down. <laughs> so is there, I guess that raises inflation, right? If the market's too hot, but why, mm -hmm. I guess, so from a novice question here, why would he want to cool the market? Is it just to chill inflation entirely? Or is it is there like some underlying reason that maybe mm -hmm. markets are too hot? Maybe they just explode like a big... Yeah, so I mean, that's runaway inflation would be the explosion. So the Fed has their dual mandate of price stability, so managing inflation, and then um, maximum employment. But the reason that it's a bad thing that the economy becomes quote unquote too hot is because inflation hurts people, right? Especially, and this is what Powell said yesterday in his presser, inflation especially hurts lower income consumers because they don't get the same amount of wage growth. They Their goods become more expensive and they just don't have the propensity to spend that a higher income consumer would have. And so the reason that the Fed intervenes when the economy is getting hot, especially as hot as 6.8% print in the CPI, um, and, and to give even more context, the Fed has an average inflation target of 2%. Inflation right. is meant to be around 2% just because of economic growth, all that stuff that the dollar has to erode. Over. That's kind of the situation there is like the Fed wants inflation to be maintained around that 2% number because then it's not at risk of running away. It's not at risk of, like you said, the economy kind of blowing its lid off um, and everything is sort of maintained at a level that the Fed can come in and intervene because not only does the economy get too hot, but it also gets too cold. And that's what we saw in March of 2020, where the Fed had this entire policy toolkit, right? They had to intervene at the local government level, at the stock market level, at the corporate level. If the Fed doesn't manage the economy when it's hot, they aren't going to be able to manage it when there's a recession happening. And so that's why it's important that they're able to have these policy tools to intervene with when this stuff happens. Yeah. Gotcha. And then when they taper, like their tapering speed, what is the yeah. difference between these tapering speeds here? Because are they are tapering. Yeah, yeah. So they, they've they been tapering for a little bit. This tapering process specifically refers to treasuries, which is U.S. government debt and mortgage-backed security mortgages that are all packaged up together. And so the Fed had to come in and intervene at the treasury level um, because that is how the U.S. government funds itself, right? And so they are going, they rolled back their purchases of U.S. government uh, bonds and bills by $15 billion a month, but they're going to roll it back now by 30 billion a month, and they're going to stop buying that stuff potentially by March of next year. Really, what the Fed is doing in this situation is helping to keep the US government afloat in terms of buying the treasuries. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes sense. And then, at its what is like a base level casual definition of tape? Mm, intervention. So, it's kind of like you can think of the Fed as providing a floor 
to that market. So people are always going to want to buy treasuries because it's U.S. government debt and it's very stable usually. It's really just the Fed coming in and providing a support level to that to those instruments. Is there any credibility to uh, the argument that perhaps raising wages would increase inflation? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's I mean, that's that's a whole barrel in a handbasket or however that analogy goes. Um, <laughs> no, this is actually so interesting because they asked Powell this yesterday during the press conference. They were like, do you where do you see wage growth? Wait, wage growth? And he was like, oh, I'm not worried about it. I don't because if you have runaway wages, that can cause inflation, too, because you got people with more money in their pockets. This is just uh, very broad. I don't say that everybody does this, but what? What do most people do when they get money in their pockets? They go spend. They go spend money. And so that's going to create even more inflation. And so wage growth is a little bit of a tough one because he said that he didn't really see any. And then there's this specific employment report that talks about wage growth. Um, and when asked, when he, when Jerome saw inflation or like what kind of what made him pivot here, he mentioned that report. So we do see uh, wages becoming potentially like an inflationary issue as well. But to your specific question, like what about wage growth? Could that help combat inflation? I think people should get paid a little bit more. I think that there's a huge misbalance and wealth disparity. I think the issue here is that if you do have runaway wage growth, um, that could create a worsening inflationary environment. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And then CPI, it raised by 0.9% in October. Good. Mm, hi. Good. Yeah. Well, so, so think about it. Like they want to have 2% a year of inflation. You right. got almost 1% in a month. And most of that came from energy, which is expected to abate because of the Biden's strategic petroleum reserve, and then also OPEC plus maybe one day increasing production. <laughs> so we, we have seen gasoline prices go down by 25%, and that wasn't baked into that CPI print. Also, retail sales came in yesterday, and they came in pretty lackluster. So we could see, I, I do think that we are going to see an element of easing inflation just because consumer demand, I think, is going to temper. I think that supply chain worries will get worked out once once consumer demand goes back down. But you have this whole other side of the Fed's dual mandate of this maximum employment number. Like I personally am the jobs market. I don't think it looks good. The labor force participation rates at like 62%, um, which is like pre great financial crisis is at 67%. And so if you think about that, like the people who are not working, I don't know where they are. The composition of the labor force is very important in determining how inflation shows up in the future. This is just the design of our economy. But if you don't have people like working at factories, you're not going to have stuff produced. And then um, if you don't have enough goods, like prices are going to have to go up. So right. That makes sense. And then Powell said in the meeting, he was worried about cyber attacks, the cyber attacks and inflation and FOMC have to do with anything together you know well i thought this was interesting because um i'm, I'm glad he said it because i feel like it's not something that we like talk a lot about but he was like i'm pretty worried that a financial institution could get hacked which is super fair and then what do you do right he said that and then the, also what happened earlier this week was a log 4j vulnerability exposure one meme said this thing that three people in nebraska helped to support is open source there was a vulnerability discovered in that and that essentially created like a backdoor for hackers to come in and direct all everything towards themselves. This big vulnerability um, is here on the internet. His point about cyber attacks is pertinent because we are seeing increasing cyber attacks. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so then log four, uh, log four, how has yeah, it not I, been patched yet? Essentially what happened here mm -hmm. is like, you ask how it hasn't been patched yet. It's a very big vulnerability and people were already able to swoop in. And part of the problem, and this gets into the whole like open source versus paid debate, is that a lot of businesses were like, oh, it's too much to migrate away from. Like, we don't really want to, like, it's going to be too much effort. Um, but then it kind of gets into like, oh, it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, it's broke. And you can't fix it. And so that's kind of the thing with Log4j. It was an if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now you it's going to be like so much harder to fix it. Yeah. Can you remove someone once they get in there or are they just stuck there? Well, I guess not like they get to just sit there forever. Yeah. The worry is that they get in and then they just sit uh, because they're not going to do anything right now because everybody knows like Log4j is a big vulnerability. So it would make more sense to just kind of sit in there for a few months and then start sending the money to your bank account have something there log for j conversation 
It's been taking up a lot of energy, but speaking of energy... <laughs> I don't know. So lithium is a key component into electric vehicles. And the the thing is with lithium, we have enough lithium, but we don't have a way to like process the lithium. And this was a big problem with, I don't know if you remember when lumber went through the roof back a few months ago. That was kind of the problem with lumber is that we had the stumps, but we didn't have the way to process the stumps. And so that's kind of what's going on with lithium here. But the issue is that lithium is a core component in this electric vehicle uh, production. And so China, of course, is swooping in and uh, taking up all the lithium because they want to produce EVs and be a core component of that market. Interesting. And so how is this affecting American supply chains and American electrical vehicle manufacturers? Um, well, so Tesla, of course, has a lot of demand for lithium, but it's, it's just diverting resources away. So because China has such a tap on the market and they're finding countries that also have a tap on the market and creating little alliances with them, especially in Africa, it, it just creates a, a more inflationary environment for the automakers because they don't have access to these very important raw materials in order to make this transition to um, green vehicles it's just one of those things that's not infinite but is there anything that truly is infinite no oh but some things oh, are less okay. infinite than other things that's true what is this <laughs> conversation <laughs> yeah no, that's a good point i think that's really the big thing with lithium is that it's important for production now poland our dear friend oh, poland coming back to them they have an energy crisis what is going yeah. on there i don't know i have like I have so many thoughts on this subject. Yeah. So essentially, Europe is just going through like an energy crisis. Europe is having an electricity power crunch. They, uh, Sweden had to turn back on their oil fire generating capacity uh, tools because it's just like the way that they have sources right now for energy it just isn't working. And so Poland had to like reach out to everybody and be like, hey, we literally just don't have enough. Um, please help us. And costs keep on increasing over there. This is something I say a lot, but like it really boils down the green energy policy and green energy investment mismatch. That's what we're seeing over there right now. Like the fact that Sweden had to revert back to generated manufacturing um, like, come on, you know? Yeah. So that's the problem over there is there was so much reliance on these tools that maybe didn't have enough investment or, you know, are a little bit harder to kind of grapple with. And now we're having to revert back to the thing that we were trying to get away from in the first place. It's been so good having you on. Thanks so much for coming on to yes. talk about NATO, talk about energy policy, and to let me talk about the FOMC for probably five minutes straight without breathing. Um, yes. Always a good time and always appreciate it. For everyone can find me on Twitter at D1Wheeler. And also I have a sub stack now, which is benwheeler.subs.com. Hey, and I have a TikTok, which is D1Wheeler. And you can follow me all there. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Anyway, uh, so yeah, hope you enjoyed the episode. I will be back tomorrow with some news on Turkey and just an analysis of the situation over there. You want to go ahead and hit subscribe. I would just super freaking appreciate that. That would be the coolest thing ever. A holiday gift to me from you it would be you subscribing to my channel. <laughs> That's how it works. All right, everybody have a wonderful, wonderful day and I will see you soon.